Hello, everyone. We're on the margins of Riga Stratcom Dialogue 2022. And I'm delighted that today we're joined uh, by a guest from Ukraine, Lubov Tsibulska. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Uh, Lubov is founder and the first head of the Center for Strategic Communication and Information Security in Ukraine. She's one of the leading experts on hybrid threats in Ukraine and advisor to the Minister of Foreign Affairs on countering disinformation. So perhaps we could start by taking a broader snapshot and drawing directly on your expertise from Ukraine. Could you tell me the distinction in how Russia targets audiences in Ukraine, maybe more international audiences versus its own domestic audience? Do you see the presence of different narratives when it comes to different audiences? Do you see the presence of varying information warfare tactics with respect to different audiences? Absolutely. I think that Russia targets different audiences in different ways. Uh, first of all, Russia has its uh, own domestic audience and uh, it works uh, very skillfully. And I think that Russia is uh, the most effective when it comes to Russian audience. Uh, Russia is trying to convince and does it pretty successfully again uh, the Russians that uh, the whole world uh, is against them uh, and nurture this sense of resentment, uh, which is very unifying feeling. It is a feeling that basically helps them to, uh, to be united uh, around one leader, dictator. Uh, another audience is Ukrainian audience, and obviously here Russia he applies totally different tactics, uh, and uh, it's not about imposing pro-Russian narratives. Mm -hmm. uh, Russia stopped imposing pro-Russian narratives and building uh, this uh, so-called Ruski Mir, Russian world, right, uh, in Ukraine in 2015-2016. Since then, Russia uh, has been uh, applying a tactic uh, of um, using internal vulnerabilities. Uh, it uh, tries to polarize us. What kind of vulnerabilities do you mean? Every gap, every mistake, every controversy we have within our society is taken um, by, by Russia. So uh, Russia tries to polarize us, to divide us, to... Uh, basically distract us uh, on our internal conflicts. Um, that's how they were trying to ruin, you know, uh, civil society, imposing these narratives on uh, uh, Sarasata, uh, like basically the repetition of Russian narratives about uh, um, uh, foreign agents. So, uh, yeah, the, every mistake we, we, we make is used by Russia and highlighted, but not just for Ukrainians, but for the whole world. And uh, for the Western audience, it's a, a bit different tactics. Uh, it's about uh, using uh, these painful spots of, uh, uh, of, of uh, Western societies and uh, uh, telling about Ukraine uh, and, and making the world look at Ukraine through Russian imperialistic lenses. Mm -hmm. This is very dangerous because uh, um, a lot of countries still do not see uh, us as independent country, uh, do not hear our voice because they still think that we belong to uh, so-called Russian sphere of influence, which is totally Russian narrative. Uh, and uh, But I think that Ukrainians made it pretty clear that we do not want to be under Russian rule. Uh, we are different because what Russia is trying to do towards Ukrainian, basically to erase our identity, uh, to say that um, we do not exist. And that's why we call it genocidal war, because they deny our identity. They want to kill and torture us and also kill and to torture our history, our culture, and our identity, who we are, basically. And uh, what about the information space in the areas that Russia, in the areas of Ukraine that Russia has managed to occupy, has managed to kind of subject to its uh, military control? Do you see efforts there to kind of integrate those regions into this alternative reality that Putin has constructed in Russia? Absolutely. The first thing they do when they come uh, and occupy our territories, they ban 
uh, Ukrainian channels. Mm -hmm. They just switch it off. Ukrainian radio, Ukrainian TV stations, Ukrainian media. Uh, and uh, the second thing they do, they bring their television there. And they put this portable, you know, screens and show, you know, Первый канал. Kind of like this show. Yes. Yeah. And, <laughs> and, and uh, Первый канал and other Russian TV channels just on the streets mm -hmm. because they know that it works. They know that uh, when people, that when person listens to this for some time, then uh, the will to fight of this person will be broken. Of course, one of the fascinating things about this war is that unlike in previous conflicts, it hasn't just played out on uh, you know CNN or BBC. It has played out on social media, on Twitter timelines, Facebook timelines. Instagram stories, even TikTok videos. So the way a Latvian, I don't know, baker would now find out about what's happening in Ukraine is not really by re reading CNN.com, but rather by seeing an Instagram video that a Ukrainian baker has posted about, you know, the destruction that a, a Russian, you know, let's say artillery shell has done in his, in his village. Um, can you speak about how this uh, has changed the nature of the information space during the conflict. Has this kind of democratization of who gets to report on what, what's happening there? Has it fostered greater empathy, do you think? Has it uh, led to a greater level of authenticity in, in the reporting? First of all, uh, one of the main features of uh, this type of warfare is uh, the factor, the importance of observer. So if you look at the history of warfare, you will see that there were a few generations, you know, and every time when technology changed, there was another uh, warfare. And now with the globalization and with the, you know, s social media spread all over the world, we see that uh, this factor of observer became crucial. Observer, which uh, means people, mm -hmm. right? Uh, they have their voice. And Russia used it especially skillfully uh, in 2014, 2015, when uh, Russia occupied Crimea. Uh, it was like, I think, just a couple uh, of days before the referendum, mm -hmm. so-called referendum, uh, when uh, Russian security services launched a few groups on social media, uh, namely FSB launched a few groups uh, on Vkontakte, Adnoklastniki, and Facebook. Uh, and uh, now we know that it, it it was bots and trolls, but at that moment uh, it looked like you know voices of average Crimean citizens, mm -hmm. and uh, they said uh, that uh, you know we are disappointed in Ukraine, we want to join Russia, and I remember very you know vividly how. Uh, respectful media, you know, credible media would pick those uh, mm. comments and post as real. So the, Russia basically used this observer factor very um, in, in, in favor of uh, occupation. Uh, and uh, now uh, I, I, I think that Russia miscalculated uh, that this factor might be in our favor as well, because the whole Ukraine stood up and uh, started, you know, posting and showing the atrocities, showing what Russia actually commits in Ukraine. And of course, it attracts a lot of sympathy, uh, a lot of engagement. So we uh, felt that our voice is heard, which was very important. And uh, but the thing is that, for instance, it doesn't work with the Russians. Like when we're trying to show them what their uh, military, what their people... There is this cognitive dissonance, right? Refusing to yeah. accept... Uh, yeah, they don't uh, want to reality. accept that uh, this is a real world. They live in the world created by uh, Russian propaganda. And that's why Russia brings, you know, Russian television, mm -hmm. Russian TV channels uh, immediately once uh, it occupies our territories. Because they know that it is possible to create this alternative reality. For these people and convince them that they actually they live good they, 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 they feel okay but about these uh, social media platforms that are part of constructing this alternative reality for example contacts as you said has this vulnerability really been closed i imagine there are still thousands maybe hundreds of thousands of ukrainians that use this platform does the ukrainian government uh, 
kind of conduct operations on these platforms as well, attempting to counter counter pro-Russian narratives? Or? First of all, uh, Russian social media of contact they are under full control of FSB starting from 2014. Mm -hmm. And in 2016, Ukraine banned this uh, social media uh, because we uh, we witnessed especially on the first uh, phase of the war in 2014 we saw a lot of information uh, operations on in influence uh, how russia targeted ukrainian military uh, their relatives and the rest of the society it was just uh, you know immense it was just a very very powerful and of course a lot of ukrainians had accounts on those social media but uh, later we realized that we do not have capacity to conduct uh, conduct uh, operations of influence on those social media because uh, they're under control of uh, you know the enemy so now we are trying to interfere. Um, there are some volunteers who do it, but generally I wouldn't say that it is significantly successful because uh, once you even hack uh, account uh, and uh, post something truth, uh, it's going to be banned like in 15, 20 minutes. So it's not the perfect platforms for uh, operations, informational operations uh, from our side. I see. But, but sorry, but what I meant to say is what I meant to ask is about those Ukrainians that are now under the occupation, under the Russian in the occupied territories. What can the what has been successful in reaching out to them? What can the Ukrainian government do to reach out to its to its citizens that are now forced to live in these, uh, you know, fake uh, people's republics and so on? First of all, there is difference between those who live under occupation since 2014. Uh, Donetsk and Lugansk regions and uh, those who live just uh, three months uh, since the beginning of the full-scale invasion. Uh, I mean, Kherson, Melitopol and some other cities. Of course, these people uh, managed to, to see uh, atrocities Russia committed and commits and they still have a lot of uh, connections like personal connections so they can get some information through phones uh, sometimes through internet so we do not see like some significant change uh, in, in their behavior they still are very patriotic they are trying to show resistance uh, you know drawing Ukrainian flags you know spreading some leaflets so there is resistance but again like uh, if if um, it takes too long, we assume that some of um, this, these movements will be oppressed. I was uh, fascinated to learn, uh, and uh, you mentioned, you alluded to this as well in our, our conversation earlier, that one specific way in which Russia targets these newly territory, newly occupied territories in Ukraine is that once the Russian forces move in, the first thing they do is one, uh, you know, implement censorship, but they also kind of literally target telecommunications infrastructure. They destroy internet and, and cell towers and so on. And of course, the reason they do this is because by removing free access to internet, they restrict people's ability to document and publish evidence about yeah. the atrocities committed there. So there's, you know, there's credible research that literally shows a correlation between access to internet and levels of atrocities committed. What lessons do you think we can garner from this? Of course, you know, we have seen, um, you know, Elon Musk take the initiative with providing Starlink services, but uh, I mean, clearly this is not enough. So what can Western governments maybe do to ensure provision of internet uh, or work in other directions? You know, many people uh, ask me, how come that you have internet everywhere, even in bomb shelters? Why do you people post, uh, you know, these terrible pictures basically, uh, you know, online, the, 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 it just happened. And now th this picture is online. Um, I think that it's a very, it's a, an advantage uh, in Ukraine that our internet is not that centralized, like in Russia or Belarus. And uh, we, we have managed to have like a broad network of internet providers. And, and that's how we managed to be successful during this war in terms of information uh, coverage. But uh, generally, like what um, lessons learned we can have, I think that first of all, we should defeat 
the aggressor and uh, by all means you know there is no like we 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 shouldn't you know always look for some small loopholes mm -hmm. you know it's just a big problem and we have to face it and solve it russia is a big problem for the whole world not just for ukraine and now we see how russia weaponizes uh, uh this uh, hunger right this food issue uh, with the grain and a lot of countries will be deprived of uh, of food because ukraine is occupied uh, partly uh so um yeah i think that we we shouldn't just you know try to grab some small things you know we should finally face that there is a big monster and we have to fight this is a dragon you know this is like our final uh, battle for many of us I mean like definitely for Ukraine and if we do not altogether stop this monster now then it's there is no point in looking for this you know loopholes when we can have some lessons learned maybe on a concluding uh, thought as a, as a concluding question I think that in the West you can see a uh, maybe a misguided sense of, of satisfaction or maybe this sort of dangerous euphoria that, you know, look, we have managed to be united in imposing sanctions. We have managed to mobilize ourselves to send military and humanitarian assistance to Ukraine. And there is, you know, euphoria. Look, Ukraine has, uh, you know, achieved great success on the ground. It has managed to hold uh, Kiev and Kharkiv and even push back the occupying forces in in um, in some directions, but what do you think the West underestimates about about this war? Could you maybe speak some unpleasant truths that that our audience needs to hear? Yes, and f I think that first of all we should understand that it's not gonna take you know just a few months. We should keep our attention focused on this for some time. And uh, it's not enough, you know, just support Ukraine and, you know, send weapons. It's very important to isolate Russia, to bring her to the point when uh, it cannot finance this war any longer. Uh, so we can measure our success only when we defeat Russia. Uh, not just, you know, okay, we send you know, this, this weapon or that humanitarian uh, aid and that's it. No, it's not going to happen this way. It's because if we, if Russia finishes with us, it will go further. It's not going to stop. And I can bring you like numbers, I think thousands of example from Russian propaganda, how it dehumanizes other nations as well and Baltic states as well. So it's not just uh, our problem. The, yes, we, we, we are very close to Russia. We, the Russia has this resentment uh, towards the Ukrainian. But if we lose this war, they will go further. As you say, this is a, a long-term challenge. This is not a, a challenge that can be kind of wished away. You know, you, you, can, you can't choose your neighbors. Russia will always be our neighbor. Do you see any prospects for the long-term deputinization of Russia? Do you see any potential uh, sources of change from within? Or is there any, or is the only solution a military victory in this war? Of course, we would like uh, Russians to do their homework and to remove uh, Putin by themselves. I think that Russian civil society completely failed because it was their job to ensure that uh, Russia preserves liberal values uh, and, and, and Putin is, is uh, not going further, occupying the power. But uh, they failed, let's admit it. So, but, uh, but yeah, I think that sooner or later we have to come to the dialogue with them. And uh, we cannot just defeat them by, uh, you know, military means and then have, uh, you know, joint future next to ne next door to them because uh, it's going to happen again it's going to repeat again and again if we do not bring them to the realization that they were wrong that they actually uh, made a huge mistake 
and we have to help them to go through this process of re-education of their society and admitting their fault. This is very important. Otherwise, we will have this war again in 10 or 20 years. Uh, on Just as a final question, you mentioned the supporting Russian civil society. I am uh, you know, proud to say that Latvia, this country, has uh, you know, given shelter to many Russian uh, journalists who have been repressed at home. I'm sure Ukraine has done the same, giving uh, asylum and giving a safe haven to, to thousands of activists and human rights advocates. How do you see uh, the future of, of supporting Russian civil society? Do we need, what sort of investments do we need to make? What sort of support do we need to provide to, to really meaningfully enable them? Well, this is a one million dollar questions. I w- a question I would say because uh, what I see, what I observe, is that Russian uh, liberal opposition. It's uh, for many Ukrainians, uh, it's almost ridiculous uh, when we call them liberal opposition. But yes, uh, uh, journalists, civil society representatives, when they left Russia, they started advocating lifting sanctions Mm. and uh, it means that they haven't managed to see the core of the problem or now they uh, defend Russian great Russian culture which also should be revised because it is very imperialistic it's very chauvinistic so I think that they should um, shift their focus right now they should focus their attention on those atrocities committed in Ukraine against Ukrainians, but not, you know, defending Tchaikovsky or uh, trying to help uh, uh, Russian soldiers, saying that they are just pure victims. It doesn't work this way, because otherwise I see also this tendency uh, with Avsanikova example, uh, Russian uh, Первый канал editor uh, in the past, uh, she was. She had such a warm welcoming in in, in Germany, in Germany, but she 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 hadn't actually admitted prior to to this whole story that she was wrong, and this is very important. They also need some, you know, I wouldn't say re-education, but they should reconsider their position, and not fight for uh, Russian liberal. Uh, opposition, but fight for democracy and liberal values, first of all. Well, this is certainly a project for multiple generations, perhaps. Uh, Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, We are very honored to have you here from Ukraine, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you so much. Thank Thank you. you.